So um, I want to welcome you all to this Wednesday's assembly. Um, even though I can't see you all, I'm really happy that you're all here. We have a great program for you today. Um, we are going to have a short prayer from Mr. Doherty. We're going to have a short presentation from Mr. Lucretio. And then we're going to have a short presentation from uh, Father Matt Malone, who is um, with America Magazine, which is a Jesuit magazine. We're very excited that he's going to be here with us. So I am going to give the floor to Mr. Doherty, who's going to lead us in prayer. All right, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin with our, our actual opening prayer, I just want to offer a brief prayer intention uh, that I heard about this morning. Please pray for the repose of the soul of John P. LaFond, who is the grandfather of freshman Cooper LaFond, who I'm sure a good number of you know. Uh, please keep Cooper and his family in your prayers during this difficult time. So I'm sure everybody has a lot on their minds this morning. So we're going to begin our time together with a short meditative prayer just to help you to focus, get centered, and to be able to listen with an open mind and an open heart to today's assembly. So let's begin by becoming aware that we are in the presence of God who knows us and loves us. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. So allow yourself to become still. Release any tension in your muscles and try to let go of any worries or concerns that you might have from this morning. Take a moment just to breathe slowly and deeply. What we're going to do this morning is similar to the examine that we often pray at prep. I'm going to ask you to reflect on a few things, and then I'm going to ask you to have a conversation with God about them at the end. So first of all, I want you to reflect on any moments, interactions, or thoughts from the last 24 hours that have caused some negative emotions to come up for you. Think about what has made you feel angry or defensive, maybe sad or frightened. How did you react to those feelings? Take a moment to honestly acknowledge those feelings, but don't let them consume you. So spend some time reflecting on those moments now. And remember to keep breathing. Now I want you to reflect on any moments of hope or joy from the last 24 hours. What made you feel encouraged, grateful, or energized? How did you react to those feelings? Are there any particular people, maybe in your own life or maybe just in the world in general, who inspired those feelings in you? Take a moment to be grateful for those people and events. Ignatian spirituality is all about finding God in all things, something we say a lot at prep. So how can you find God in this moment? Where do you find meaning or purpose? What do you feel called to do in response to the last 24 hours? Take some time to silently have a conversation with God about this. Finally, let's prepare to enter into our assembly. Today, you may hear some things that you agree with and maybe some things that you don't. 
how can you prepare yourself so that you can listen with a spirit of respect and openness, and not just close yourself off? More broadly, in your life, how can you show love and charity to people with whom you strongly disagree? If you think about previous interactions, are you respectful when you interact with others in person, online, or maybe when you talk about people when they're not in the room? Do you give the same respect that you would want yourself? Take some time now to think about how you want to move forward. So let's close our meditation with the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, who was known for his ability to make peace and his love for all people. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Peter, Amen. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn the floor over to Mr. Lucretio. Thank you very much, Mr. Doherty, Ms. Freelander. Um, thank you uh, guys for giving me a few minutes of, of your time here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to circle back to this in a minute, but really at, at, the, at the heart of what I'm going to discuss this morning um, is that line from, from Mr. Doherty's prayer. Uh, uh, praying to not so much seek to be understood as to understand. Um, when I was a freshman in college, uh, when, whenever you're a freshman in college, one of the first things that happens is you get this control sheet from your, from your guidance counselor, and it tells you what classes you have to take. Um, and there, there are classes, of course, that are heading towards your degree, your major or your minor or both. And then of course, there are what are called gen ed classes, uh, classes that everyone has to take regardless of, of what degree they're seeking. So one of my gen ed classes that my counselor scheduled for me right in the very first semester of my freshman year of college was a class called Rhetoric 101. And I had no idea what it was, what it was gonna be about. Uh, of course, I, I know what the word rhetoric means. Um, but uh, so I, I, I go to this class and uh, I discover that the purpose of this semester in this class was gonna be about public speaking, uh, about conversation and about debate. And almost immediately, I became fascinated with the subject. Uh, so much so that even when I finished Rhetoric 101, I went on to continue to study uh, the content of the course over the course of my college career, even though it was it had nothing to do with, with my major or my minor. Um, and it, very quickly, I realized why I was so fascinated with it. Uh, we spent a lot of time on debate strategies and how to uh, uh, make yourself be understood um, and how to, how to really you know, win a, a, a debate that was part of the, the public speaking process. And the reason I was so fascinated with it is that I understood early on that we as human beings want to turn everything into a debate. Uh, every conversation that we enter into, uh, we enter into consciously or unconsciously uh, with an idea towards winning, towards um, making the person or group that we are debating with uh, come to our side of, of, of beliefs uh, to, 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 make, to prove that we are right. And sometimes the best way to do that uh, is to simply prove that the other person is wrong. And that becomes a very dangerous mindset. It becomes a very uh, dangerous way of thinking when you're entering into conversations about important topics. Now, just a few weeks ago, I'm, I'm in the gym. Um, it was probably during a sophomore lunch or it might've even been a junior senior lunch. And I got pulled over into a conversation where we quickly turned it into a debate uh, uh, about 
who is the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? And when that is the topic of conversation, debate is okay. Uh, oh, we, were, we were trying to, each of us, you know, show why we were right and give stats that prove our point of view and, and talk about why the other person is wrong. When the topic is more important, when we find ourselves here today on November 4th, uh, following election day, or in the world we live in today, in a society of uh, social and racial injustice, when, when those are the conversations we're entering into, we need to go beyond debate. And that is a, a lot of what I learned over the course of studying uh, public speaking in, in, in college that, that began uh, in, in Rhetoric 101. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the hallmarks of debate and what it means to go beyond debate and to enter in, into, into dialogue uh, with a person or, or a group and why that's so important um, when you are in the days, weeks, and months ahead entering into conversations with friends, family uh, about important topics, topics that are going to shape your life, topics that are going to shape the world. Um, over the over these coming years. Hallmarks of debate. If you find yourself in a conversation where your objective is to succeed or, or win, um, then you, you are simply at the very base debate level. You are trying to prove that you are right, that the other person is wrong, and you have all of these hidden strategies and, 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 and there, there are, there's an art form to it. There, there, are, there, are, there are set ways in, in which people who are skilled in the art of debate uh, prove their point. One of those ways is to look for weakness in your opponent's argument. Um, you know, of course it, it should go without saying that no one is perfect and, and no point of view is, is perfect. And so if you are at the base debate level, if that is, is the, the level of conversation you are at, then it is easy to find weakness in your opponent's argument and, the, and their point of view. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how dangerous that is when you're, when you're in a conversation about important topics. And, and I'm going to circle back to that um, on my very last slide, right at the end, right before I turn it over to Father Malone. In debate, you focus on right and wrong. There is no ambiguity. There is no gray area. There is no um, room for feelings or point of view or perspective. Everything is simply uh, right or wrong. You are right. The other person or the other group is wrong. And this is probably the most important point. And again, this is something I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back to uh, on my last slide. When you are in a conversation that you are turning into a debate or the other person is turning to a debate or the group, it is a debate, um, you are judging the other person's viewpoints as inferior or invalid. You are standing on some sort of moral high ground where, where you are absolutely right. And uh, by default, that means that the person or group that you are in conversation with is less than or other or wrong. In debate, you lean in, you do all the talking, you, you, you dominate the narrative. Um, because if you're doing all of the talking, then regardless of what you're saying, uh, if the other person or the other group doesn't have a chance to speak, then, uh, then they can't win the argument. They, they can't uh, uh, prove to you why, or, or, or explain to you why they feel the way they feel. Um, and more importantly, you know, in a debate, it usually involves not only the, the people directly involved in the debate, it, there are, you know, spectators, there are people in the surrounding area. And, it, you know, when you turn a conversation into a debate, you are not only typically looking to prove to the person you're in the debate with that you're right and that they're wrong, you want everyone within earshot to know how right you are. Um, and so if you're doing all of the talking and you don't let uh, the person you're in conversation with speak, then again, it doesn't even matter what you're saying. No one is hearing anything else. So by default, you, you know, you must, you must be 
the one who, who has the, the, the right perspective. We're, we're not in a position today or in the world today to turn everything into a debate. When we do that, we are in very dangerous territory. Um, and we at St. Peter's Prep especially are called to do more. We are, we are called to be more uh, than, than men and women who, who simply try and, and impose our, our will and, and our viewpoints on others. Instead, we need to go further. We need to take it to the next level of conversation. And that would be going from, from debate to dialogue. The purpose of dialogue, when you enter into a dialogue, when you enter a, into a conversation with another person or a group um, at this level, it's not about succeeding or winning. It's not about proving to the other person that you're right and that they're wrong. It's not uh, about invalidating another person's perspective or point of view. It's about broadening your own perspective. It's about learning about how or, and why someone else or another group uh, feels the way they do. And you can use that to help inform your own opinions. That can be really tough. That can be really tough. What, what we're asking you to do here in dialogue is accept the fact that maybe you're not entirely right. Maybe you don't have the, the entire picture of society as a whole. Uh, maybe you don't have the entire picture of your friends or your family or your loved ones lived experiences and why they feel the way they do. Rather than looking for weakness, you look for shared meaning. What this means is that what you're looking for when you're entering into dialogue with a person or a group is some sort of connection. Um, clearly, you're talking about the same topic, but you have different points of view, and that's okay. Where, where is that Venn diagram, you know, mesh point? Where is that circle in the middle where, where, the, where the two of you uh, uh, understand a part of that topic from the same point of view? You don't focus on right and wrong. Instead, you invite differences of opinion. By inviting differences of opinion, you are Going back to that first point, there's your opportunity to broaden your own perspective. If you surround yourself with people who believe exactly what you believe, who think the way that you think, who do the things that you do, then you're, you're on a very myopic path. Um, there, there is no way to learn more about the world and how it functions. If you simply have a set point of view, and rather than challenging that and learning more about why you feel the way you feel and why others feel the way they feel, if you just surround yourself with people who share that, that opinion, then uh, you're, you're being very closed off to the world. You need to challenge your own preconceived notions. Um, now, again, very, very difficult, very difficult because what I'm asking you to do here is to accept that there are lived experiences of the person you are entering into conversation with that have shaped their perspective. Well, clearly, of course, you have your own lived experiences that have shaped your perspective and, and worldview. And I'm not asking you to discount those. I'm asking you to open up to the idea that the person you are in conversation with or the group that you are in conversation with, they have lived experiences also. Rather than lean in and do all the talking and try and dominate the narrative, you need to lean out. You need to listen and you need to think. Listening is probably the most difficult thing in the world to do. Um, most of us like to talk. Most of us you know, feel as though it, if we're talking, then, then we're controlling our, our, our fate. We're controlling our destiny. We're controlling you know, our moment right now here. In, in, to sit there and do nothing but listen uh, is difficult, but it's the only way we learn. Most importantly, and, and, and I touched on this uh, um, a moment ago, um, in that prayer, 
that Mr. Doherty opened with, uh, seek not so much to understand, uh, to, to be understood as, as to understand. Here is what I would like for you to understand. If you are turning a conversation about an important topic, and there are lots of important topics out there today, especially, and over the last months and year, um, if you are entering into a conversation about an important topic and you enter it with the mindset that it is a debate, that you are trying to win, that you are trying to prove that you are right, that you are trying to, to prove that the other person is wrong, then essentially what you're saying is that the person you are in conversation with who has had lived experiences that shaped that perspective, they have the viewpoint they have because of things that have happened to and for and with them and to their loved ones and to their family and their friends. If you are turning that conversation into a debate, you are telling them that those lived experiences are not important. You're saying, I don't care about what it is that has shaped your perspective. I am right. You are wrong. Here is why. Okay. And just think for a second. How would you feel? How would you feel if you we're in a conversation with someone and they try to make you feel as though this very significant and impactful and important experience in your life was unimportant. Okay, that is what happens when you dangerously stray towards debate and refuse to open yourself up to entering into dialogue. I, I, I know I'm over my time. I apologize for stealing more than what was a few minutes of, of your time here this morning. Um, but this is, this is the time to really challenge yourself and, and, and find out if you are willing to open yourself up and to really strengthen the bonds of your friendships and your, your family ties at a time where it, it, it can be dangerously close to ruining them, okay? Um, but now you... you as opposed to taking the, those risks of, of, of damaging and ruining friendships and family relationships, you, you have an opportunity to actually strengthen them uh, if you're willing to, to move past the art of debate and enter into you know, the challenge of, of dialogue. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I, I apologize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this back over to Mr. Doherty. But, uh, St. Peter's Prep, uh, I really appreciate a few minutes of your time this morning. Um, and, and my door is always open for, for any of you who, who want to, to, to stop in. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucretio. Uh, some wonderful insights I think we can all benefit from. So I am now honored to introduce our guest speaker for today, Father Matt Malone, SJ. Father Malone is the president and editor-in-chief of America Media, a Jesuit media ministry that produces podcasts, videos, and America Magazine, the Jesuit Review of Arts and Culture. Father Malone has served in his current role since 2012. Previously, he served as an associate editor from 2007 to 2009 when he covered foreign policy and domestic politics. Father Malone entered the, entered the Society of Jesus in 2002 and was ordained a priest in 2012. Prior to religious life, Father Malone served as special assistant and speechwriter to U.S. Representative Martin T. Meehan of Massachusetts. From 1997 to 2002, he served as the founding deputy director of Mass Inc., an independent political think tank, and co-publisher of Commonwealth, its award-winning review of politics, ideas, and civic life. He's the author of Catholiques Sans Etiquette, a book concerning the church and the political, which was published by 24, in 2014 by Salvatore Press in Paris. Father Malone was a founding member of Remus, an inter interdisciplinary research group at Haythrop College, is a member of the Colloquium on Violence and Religion, and serves as the chaplain to the New York Press Club. Father Malone serves on the board of trustees of Boston College, of the Appeal of Conscience Foundation, and on the board of directors of the Catholic Medical Mission Board and the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture. On a personal note, I'd like to say that, especially during this election season, I have really benefited from reading his writing on American politics and culture. The thoughtful content that American media publishes really helps me to reflect on how to best live my life of faith during these really extraordinary times, and I would recommend that you check them out. So now please join me in welcoming Father Matt Malone. 
good morning, everybody. Uh, I probably look a little tired because perhaps like you, I was up all night uh, watching what the events that are happening in our country. And I can imagine that like the rest of the country, you're anxious to know what's, what is going on. And uh, there might even be some fear or anxiety or excitement around all of that. Um, so I thought this morning I would talk a little bit about what, what, what are the spiritual resources that, that we can draw on uh, as, as people of faith uh, from the Jesuit tradition uh, during a time of uncertainty like this? Um, and also talk a little bit about what I, what I think of the, is the underlying cause for this, this, uh, in, this instability that we're seeing in, uh, in our national politics and why the, the, the kind of thing that you were just talking about transforming debate into dialogue is so vitally important um, for the, to the future of, of our country um, and is the invitation of, of our faith. Um, so the first thing that I think is, uh, is, is important to remember, I remembered this morning something my father said to me uh, when I was a kid, which is that uh, panic is the enemy of life. Um, there, the, a lot of people tend to think that the, that the opposite of faith is doubt, but that's not actually true. Doubt is a, is a, is a part of faith. Um, everybody who is human doubts from time to time. Even people who have the strongest faith at time can have doubts. Uh, we learn from the life of Mother Teresa, one of the holiest people who's ever lived that at times she even doubted uh, what her mission, what her vocation was. Um, so doubt is not the opposite of faith. What we learn from the scriptures time and again, and this is why Jesus uh, talks about this so often in the gospels, what we learn is that fear is the, actually the opposite of faith. Um, and that is why, as I said, Jesus says time and time again, uh, be not afraid, right? Uh, Jesus' presence uh, in the Gospels casts out fear. Right? And why is that important? Um, it's okay to be afraid, and it's okay to feel fear, right? But we have to be very cautious about acting out of it. And when, um, In fact, it's not only okay to feel it, we have to be able to acknowledge it and say when we're afraid. Because that helps us then not to act out of our fear, out of our panic, right? So you, you see this all the time. Like if you're watching a movie, and there's an explosion or something like that, somebody will say to the, to, to the folks, don't panic, right? Why? Because if you act out of that panic, you can make the situation worse. You could actually put yourself in greater danger, right? So what's important is that, yeah, we are able to acknowledge our fear. We're able to, to see that we have it. It's a perfectly human reaction, but that we not act out of it. And we not allow it to, to grow unchecked and become a kind of panic, um, because then our our actions become less uh, reliable, less trustworthy, in a sense. Well, in the Christian tradition, the thing that allows us to take a breath uh, and step back and uh, to, to recognize, yeah, we might be afraid and anxious, but we don't have to act out of it, is the realization that um, that we are not God, right? So as scripture also tells us and invites us to do, be still and know that I am God, right? And the wonderful thing about that invitation from scripture is uh, I always think, I mean, the be still is a, it's a nice calming invitation, but the second part is actually even more important. Be still because you, you, you know that I am God which means that you are not, right? And I am not, right? I have a friend of mine who's a fellow Jesuit who says, uh, he says there's good news and uh, there's better news. So the good news is there is a God. The better news is it isn't you, right? <laughs> there is someone who's holding the universe in, in being. And there is somebody who uh, in the person of Jesus who's actually fought the final battle uh, and conquered evil and death for us. Um, so those are not our battles, <laughs> right? Um, and that puts it in perspective, I think. It helps us to remember that, okay, 
I, I don't have to be God. I don't have to be general manager of the universe, right? I can just be me. And that's a necessary precondition to entering into that kind of dialogue that you were just talking about, right? Because when we act out of faith, then our encounters with others can actually be a dialogue. It can be an encounter rather than a, simply a confrontation. When we act out of fear, we tend to, to turn the someone we are talking into, we are talking to, uh, into a something that has to be bulldozed over, right? Because I got to win this argument at all costs. Um, so all of that, I think, is, is for, certainly for me, it's worth remembering. But it's particularly worth remembering on a morning like this, where there's so much uncertainty going on in the country. Um, you know, I, as both a student of politics and, uh, a, and a former practitioner of politics, um, and as a Jesuit priest, uh, it's interesting to watch these events uh, from these kind of dual, with this kind of dual perspective. And one of the things that I, uh, that I see in American politics today, and we saw this play out yesterday, and we're continuing to see it play out in the results, is that that fear that I was talking about, which often manifests as a fear of the other, as a fear of, of someone who has a different point of view, as someone who has a different way of looking at the world, that fear structures a lot of our interactions as a country um, and leads to this thing that we call polarization, right? So for those, if, if you may not know, polarization is, is, is what happens in a democracy when you have two sides that are locked in battle with one another, right? So, and I'm not talking about two groups of people who just disagree with each other because that's what you need to have a democracy. You need to have people who disagree with each other, then you have a debate and then you go out and vote, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about two groups of people, two polar opposites, right? Who, each of whom sees the other as somehow um, almost unhuman, right? As sees the other as not worthy of my consideration sees the other as something that can be dismissed out of hand, right? Uh, sees the other as some, some, someone or some group of someones that is utterly irredeemable in some social sense, sometimes even in a moral sense, right? And, we'll, and we've seen this um, throughout some of our, you know, we've all heard stories, I'm sure, perhaps some of us have even experienced it of family members and friends and who don't, even talk to each other anymore because of their disagreements about politics. That means we're living in a polarized world, right? And the whole country for a lot of really complex historical reasons is structured that way right now. Um, so here's something that it, that's interesting, right? We don't know exactly who won this race yet. I mean, we, we who, for president, um, I, I think we have a pretty good idea of where it's headed, but we don't really know because it's close. You know, there are in in uh, in some places with millions of people that might be decided by ten thousand votes, right? Um, it's close. It's a very close election. But here's the thing: the vast majority of Americans live in a congressional district, live in a place that would have voted for either Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden by 15 or more points. And yet it's not a 15 point election between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump. So why is that? It's because we don't live with people we disagree with. We just don't. We don't, we don't, we don't, we, don't, we are not exposed to people we disagree with generally. We don't live in places where people by and large, there's a sizable number of people who think differently than we do. Um, that is another, that's additional evidence of polarization. So not only are we not able to have that encounter in dialogue rather than that confrontation, right? Um, we're not even sharing the same space, right? We're not sitting in the same movie theaters. We're not sitting in the same diners, right? Um, 
the world, the, the country is polarized, right? Now, what do we do about that polarization, right? Well, it can seem like a really big force that is sort of overtaking the, the life of the country, overtaking our own lives. And a lot of us, I think, are, you know, nobody, nobody would blame us if we sat back and said, this is too big. It's, it's too painful. It's, it's, it's anxiety inducing. I don't want to have anything to do with this. Right. But we know both as citizens, but even, but from our faith too, that you can't with just withdraw from a community because we're not radical individuals. We, in some, in some, uh, in very important ways, we belong to each other. We're social animals, human beings, right? And uh, forming community, whether it's a religious community or uh, a uh, social community or a political community, those are natural human acts, right? So we can't just withdraw into ourselves. Um, but what I would say is the thing that, that can help us in that sense of, with that sense of helplessness is to look at our own actions, right? In other words, if, if we say, oh, we got this big problem with polarization and, and then uh, each of us says, and it's, uh, we got this big problem with polarization and it's, it's his or her fault, right? When you do that, you actually become part of the problem <laughs> of polarization, right? <laughs> Uh, so by looking inward at ourselves and our own actions, right, we can begin to see, okay, what are the ways in which I'm a part of this problem myself, right? And that can be scary because none of us wants to admit that we're part of the problem, right? But what I would say to you is, as, as, uh, as scripture tells us, the truth will set you free, right? If you begin to see ways in which you can change your own life and your own actions and uh, to make yourself a part of the solution right then you can then we you can begin to see a way forward but as long as it's somebody else's fault as long as it's somebody else that's causing polarization as long as it's somebody else that's you know being that's 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 making this all a terrible thing then there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but the funny thing is when you can say, I am a part of this reality and there are good ways and there are not so good ways in which I'm a part of this reality. When you can look at that honestly, what in Jesuit spirituality we call an examine, right? When you examine your conscience and your actions and you say, hmm, what feels like it's life-giving and what feels like it's inducing fear and panic, right? When you can weigh those things and then say, so in light of that examination, I'm gonna choose differently. I'm gonna make different choices. And some of them are really quite practical, right? Um, you know, so it, it, it comes down to things as easy as, uh, a lot of us get our, all of our news through social media through either Twitter or Instagram and so forth. Am I following people that think differently than I do, right? I'm not talking about people who have crazy extreme ideas about things, right? I'm talking about people who have a different view of whatever the issue is, right? Um, or a different view of the candidates. Am I following people? Have I got people in my feed that, that think differently than I do? Right, we're going to prompt me to to either reconsider what I believe or what my opinion is or my view is of something, or are going to prompt me to 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 think more more deeply about my own view, right? Um, so that I can better present it to others. Am I reading stuff from places that I might disagree with? Right. So if you if you're you are following online a particular writer or a magazine or a newspaper, um, are you do you, do I take the time to consult, you know, 
uh, a newspaper, a magazine, or a writer might have a different view, right? Um, or thirdly, when I encounter somebody that gives some indication that I that they think differently than I do, or they have a different opinion or something, do I, do I go right for that and go for the juggler and say, uh, you know, this is now this is now a fight to the death, or do I see this as an opportunity to encounter somebody and to listen to what they have to say, right? Um, do I seek that person out? Right? Do I take that person out for a cup of coffee or a walk in the park or whatever it is and not talk about politics, right? But to talk about the things we have in common, you know, whether it's some sport or activity that we like or family or friends or whatever it is, right? So that we remember we have a common humanity and that politics is not the, it's not, it's not the beginning of life and it's not the end of it either, right? It's one way in which we experience it. So that work though of, you know, and yeah, there are lots of stuff. There is lots of stuff that has to happen in terms of public policy and new laws and all of that stuff to help fix this problem. But, but really in the end, it comes down to you and me, right? Um, recognizing how we are a part of this um, and how we, through our own individual actions, can change it, right? And if enough of us do that, <laughs> right? Then the next thing you know is you have a movement, right? And you, know, you can change all the laws and you can get all the new different policies and you can vote everybody out and vote a whole bunch of new people in, but at this part, you and me, if that doesn't change, then all of that's for nothing, right? So uh, that's what I would encourage you to be thinking about, particularly those of you who either, uh, who have voted or, th or are gonna be certainly voting in the next presidential election. Like, how can you enter into that experience bearing witness to what Pope Francis calls the reality of the human being who is in front of me? Because at the end of the day, uh, we all share this same brief existence. Uh, we're all human. We all generally value the same things, right? Family and friendship and, uh, and work and, succeed and success and prosperity. Uh, at the end of the day, that common humanity is what binds us together. Um, and, and being able to see that in the other, being able to see that the person I'm talking to, whether I agree with them or I don't, is as much loved and cherished by the God who created this person in his image as I am or any human being is, is essential, right? Because it lowers, it lowers the stakes. It reminds us in a way to be still and know that I am God, right? <laughs> um, and what that means is then when we do disagree with each other, we can do it with a certain amount of freedom and we can disagree with each other without doing violence to each other, right? Without ridiculing each other, right? Our disagreements then become a thorn in the side rather than a dagger in the heart. Um, there is a, uh, there, you know, St. Ignatius, who founded the Jesuits, St. Ignatius of Loyola, he was studying, he was a student in Paris um, when he, he met another student named Francis Xavier. And then the two of them and their friends, they went out and they started the Jesuits. Well, at the time that Ignatius was studying in Paris, Paris was literally burning around him. There was a huge fight going on between Catholics and Protestants in Paris, right? And it had been ignited by campaigns, really, between Catholics and Protestants with placards, today what we would call bumper stickers, <laughs> right? But placards that were, they were hanging up on the on walls and on streets, and then they would take to the streets and they would have protests, they would shut down streets, and they would set stuff on fire. And sometimes people got hurt, sometimes people were killed. All of this is happening around Ignatius. And yet, 
in Ignatius's diary from that whole time in Paris, he never mentions it. And that's because he was focused. He was focused on his relationship with God and the and his relationship, not with that mob, not with that huge event, but with the person who's right in front of me. That's where he was focused. One person, one soul at a time. That is the way of Ignatius. So uh, those are some thoughts about <laughs> some really big stuff. Um, and if we have a way of doing it, I'd be happy to, to take any questions or comments. I believe we do, right, uh, Ms. Friedlander? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to change the chat. So now, okay, here, I should just let me make sure I can do this before I, yeah, okay. So um, attendees of this webinar, now you can chat just with the four of us. So I'm the only one who's gonna look at it uh, and you are not anonymous. I will see what you write. So you may chat a question to Father Malone and I will um, read some good ones out. And um, yeah, so go ahead and um, think of some questions and chat them now. Um, Father Malone, I actually have a question while we're waiting. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering how your experience um, in politics informs your um, current career uh, as a Jesuit. As a Jesuit. Uh, that's really that's a really interesting question. I mean, one way that it does is what I what I see in politics uh, as often the motivating force in people's lives. Uh, is often what I see in in the as the motivating force in people's lives as a Jesuit priest, right? And so what I mean is, um, whether it's politics or whether it is uh, uh, religious faith, uh, our our lives really are uh, affected by this relationship between faith and fear, right? So exactly just what I talked about. Um, and we tend to be uh, we tend to be afraid of the same things, and we tend to hope for the same things, <laughs> whether it's politics or whether it's 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 in a life of faith or in the church. Um, and that the antidote to that is 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 a faith that comes to us through this person uh, that is a Jesus Christ. Um, and in the political sphere, what that means is that <clears throat> it can express the best of who we are. Uh, but when you have when you have political leaders or movements that 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 play on our fears, it can also it can also bring out the worst in who we are. Thank you for that. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, here is a good question. Um, any tips on how to engage in dialogue with those who want no party of it? You mean who want no no part no. of politics? Or, yeah, no part right. of it. Oh, sorry, I got a I got right. a little <laughs> adjustment. <laughs> sorry about that. Who want no right. part of it? <laughs> yeah. Well, on, on some level, um, I think you have to respect that choice, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, as I said, you know the te the teaching of the church, and I think the sort of internal logic of being um, a disciple of Jesus means we do have to engage with the community and we do have to care about these issues. But there are some people for one reason or another, either by their temperament or by their choice perhaps, or maybe they're just overwhelmed by other things in their lives. They're not focused on these issues. And we have to respect that choice rather than trying to make them become interested in it. So what I would suggest is, you know, rather than trying to make them become interested or, uh, or make them be as concerned about this as you are, uh, to ask them, you know, why is this something that you don't think about, right? You know, why is this something that you don't wanna be a part of? Um, help me to understand your choice better so I can better support you as a friend or a family member. So 
And that that that'll often be, and they'll tell you important things, I think, in response to that question, because something more important is going on in their lives, because maybe they don't feel they know enough or will ever know enough to be a part of the conversation. Or maybe they're just afraid because uh, whenever they engage in these conversations, it, it people get really nasty and they don't want to have anything to do with that. So uh, yeah, ask questions is what I would say, rather than trying to make them see an answer. If, yeah. if you don't if you don't mind, Ms. Friedlander, uh, just as I was reading that question, uh, maybe I misread it completely. Uh, I understood it as the person who was asking the question was wondering, uh, not necessarily about people who don't want to enter into conversation about politics, but right. I read it more as how do you enter into dialogue with someone who has no desire to enter into dialogue with you? Uh, yeah. if, if, if you if you have a desire to enter into dialogue and to be open uh, to to accepting and learning about others experiences, but the person you're in conversation with only wants to debate only wants to prove that they're right and you're wrong how how how, how do you encourage others to enter into dialogue with you. Right, so the way to uh, also a great question. Uh, the and more often than not, I think you actually probably meet people who are more in the former category of not even wanting to have these conversations. <laughs> but if you have somebody who doesn't want to enter into dialogue with you, right, you can't make them do it. Um, and if you, if you approach that encounter as, oh, okay, so we're not going to have a dialogue, so we're going to do this a different way. Now we're, now we're going to have a fight to the death here. Um, then that undermines your initial invitation to bring them into a dialogue, right? So what we wanna be able to, what we, the, the, the most uh, important testimony that we can offer is through our actions, right? Not through our words per se. So often enough, when, uh, when I'm encountering somebody who feels very differently than I do uh, and doesn't want to engage in a dialogue, I will say, I am your friend. If you want to have a conversation among friends about these things, uh, I'm happy to have one with you, but I don't need a debating partner. And often enough, that's enough for somebody to, sometimes they just walk away, but more often than not, they're like, okay, so let's take a breath. And you can sometimes find a way in there. Signaling your basic respect through your words and actions for the other person uh, is critical to creating that space in which a dialogue can happen. And sometimes it will, and sometimes it won't. Um, but if, 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 we, if, we, if we just go in and see it as a battle, then um, it'll never happen. That's great. Okay, we've got, we've got some questions rolling in, so. Let me, let me choose one. Okay, um, so here is a great question. Um, I find it challenging as a lifelong Black Catholic that our bishops have not been more vocal regarding the racial pandemic that is occurring in our country. Some have spoken, but they are few. Many Protestant ministers are speaking out and America Magazine has gonna, done a good job of covering this topic. Um, any thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you for reading America. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, you're right. So um, the, the church in the United States, uh, which is, uh, you know, led by our bishops, has, has not done enough to address these issues and to speak out about them. Um, that's not to say they haven't done anything because they have made a series of uh, really uh, of powerful statements about it, which you can find at America Magazine. And there are some individual bishops who in their dioceses are doing really important and transformative work around these issues. But as a church, no, I don't think we're measuring up yet. And, uh, you know, that is, that can be hard for white Catholics like me to admit, but it's very important that white Catholics do admit that, right? And that we, that we enter into 
this kind of dialogue that we're talking about, not just with black Catholics or with brown Catholics, but with other white Catholics. Um, but I think it has to begin from a place of humility, from the recognition that uh, I'm not God. I don't have all the answers. I am a part of this. I'm a part of all that I've experienced. I'm a part of this problem. Therefore, I can be a part of the solution. Right? Um, I, I wrote a piece recently in America a few months ago uh, in which uh, it was an open letter that I wrote to my fellow white Catholics about my own experience of coming to terms with my own internalized uh, bigotry and with the question of, of, of race in my own life. And what I really wanted to do was not, you know, hammer away at people and tell them how bad they are and, and all the rest. But I wanted to talk from my own experience of having had a conversion around these issues and testifying to that. And what I found, right or wrong, you know, whether I got it right or wrong isn't the point. The point is that from starting from that place um, of my own, of talking about my own life, my experience of these things, it again, it opened up that space in which I, we could have dialogue with others. Not with everybody, not everybody took the invitation. But some people did. But you're right. As an institution, as an institutional church, we haven't done enough, and we need to do more. Um, but that also doesn't absolve us, uh, especially I think, white Catholics, of doing the, the the personal work of coming to terms with uh, our history and our reality, present reality around this. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I'm seeing a lot of questions about. Um, uh, religious principles and politics. So I'm just going to pick one. Um, if you rely solely on religious principles to maintain good faith in a political conversation, how do you promote dialogue that will cause understanding with a person of different religious beliefs? Well, I think, you know, the principles of, um, you know, seeing the other as fully human of making sure that our interactions with, with others are encounters and not confrontations, of acting in humility, of listening before we speak. These are values that come from my own Catholic Christian faith, but they're not exclusive to Catholic Christian faith, right? They are values that, that I think a lot of people, most people would would say these are important values. Now, we don't always live up to it, right? We don't always bring them into the conversation and into our interactions in the way that we should, but they are values that, that transcend faith. I mean, people of no faith could hold to these values too. And, uh, and, and that's important. All right, let's see, maybe we'll just do like a couple more. Um, sure. Do you ever consider it permissible to reject common ground in extreme situations? Yes. So <laughs> there, um, the answer to that is yes. <clears throat> so when we're talking about um, what I'm talking about here is the kinds of conversations that you have or could have with the majority of people because the, ma the majority of people, they may have very different views. They may feel very differently, but they, they don't have hate in their heart. And uh, they, they generally want the same things that, that all human beings want, right? But there are groups and there are individuals that are outside of that who are intent on destroying other people. And whether it's uh, the far, the far right, and uh, you know their 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 hatred of immigrants, right, or it's the far left and their 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 hatred of you know rich people and you know burning down banks, uh, the those are groups you can't dialogue with, right? Not because the will is lacking on our part, but because it's simply not there on their part, right? And um, so there are boundaries, right? There are, there are moments in life 
and in the life of a country where we have to stand up and say, nope, on this, there can't, we cannot move. Uh, at the same time, I think those moments occur far less frequently than we think they do. That usually in our encounters with other people, there is room for creating a space where you can dialogue. Um, that those moments where we really come into contact with those extreme elements that are immovable and intent on destroying others are, are relatively rare. Okay. Great answer, thank you. Okay, maybe we'll just do one more. Um, okay, this is a, oh, this is a good question. Do you think that we as Catholics should vote a certain way? Well, I think you should certainly vote. And yes, I think you should vote a certain way uh, according to your conscience. That is what mm -hmm. the US bishops have told us, right? Um, it's the, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church as, as it's been handed down to us from our teachers, the bishops, is that we should examine uh, the Catholic view of, of the social and moral issues we're talking about, whether it's immigration, whether it's racism, whether it's uh, abortion, euthanasia, questions of life, the death penalty, economic justice. Um, we look at all of those issues, what the church teaches about them. And then we, we think about it, we pray about it, and we say, okay, what is my conscience telling me to do? Not just in light of what the church teaches, but in light of what the church teaches in the reality in which we're living today, right? So the, the certain way we're supposed to vote as Catholics is according to the dictates of our conscience, right? And anyone, whether they're a liberal or a conservative who tells you that because you are a Catholic, you have to vote for X is not correct. That is just not correct because if, if we had no choice, if we had no, uh, if we had to vote for this person instead of that person, then why would the bishop say that we should pray about it and decide in our conscience, right? If we have to vote a certain way, then there's no decision to be made. Why would we even need our conscience? We'll just do what we're told. But that's not what they said, right? And that's important because conscience is the voice of God speaking to us. Mm -hmm speaking to us in a very complicated world. So for example, I live in New York City, right? Um, New York City is an overwhelmingly democratic city. Uh, in most elections, I don't even have the option of voting for somebody who opposes abortion. Mm -hmm. I, I simply don't. So our bishops recognize that the, that the complexity of the world uh, means that we have to, a favorite word of uh, Pope Francis, we have, to we have to undergo a discernment, right, of carefully weighing the values that we hold dear in light of the circumstances in which we find ourselves living, and then in our conscience decide what we as individuals must do. That's a great answer. Um, I think Mr. Doherty has just one more question. Okay. We'll say goodbye. Yeah, sure. um, there was one question that I saw come up uh, in, in a few different ways, uh, which was specifically how to um, interact in good faith with somebody who is uh, either bringing up conspiracy theories, uh, the example somebody used with QAnon, or things that are blatantly untrue. Right. Right. So uh, <laughs> that, is a, uh, that is a difficult thing because, all right, so the way that I have talked about it, right, is, um, so if somebody says, well, you know, the Democrats are running a terrible, you know, crime operation out of a pizza parlor someplace, <laughs> and, and, you know, you know, it's not true. It's just one of those crazy internet theories. Usually, the best way to respond to that is not to say, well, that's just crazy, you know, I mean, everybody knows that that's false, right? Because not everybody knows that that's false. And very often people believe these things in good faith, right? So the last thing you wanna do if you want to talk to them and give them different information is to make them feel stupid or to make them feel like an idiot, right? 
So how we react in that situation is key to how open they're going to be to the new information we're going to give them. Because a lot of people, I mean, you do, you understand how the internet works because you're young <laughs> and you know how the social media works, but a lot of people don't know. So a lot of, pe a lot of people really don't know that they created their own newsfeed, right? And that every time they like this story or that story, it, there's a computer in Silicon Valley that creates another story for them, <laughs> right? That is similar. They, they, they don't make the connection between their own choices and then the information flow that's coming back to them, right? So most of the time, particularly older people, and I'm an older person too, <laughs> don't know that this information is false. They believe it in good faith. Um, and so the, the way to talk about that then is to say, uh, well, how do you know that, right? Where, where did you hear that, right? And then you could say, well, they, and they'll say, well, I saw it on this thing that, that said, okay, well, you know, there are really great journalists out there uh, working at newspapers and magazines who've actually demonstrated that that's not true, right? Um, and then they might come back and say, oh, but you know, the Wall Street Journal is hopelessly conservative or the New York Times is hopelessly liberal. And, and, and that's where you know, be, being aware of certain kinds of, uh, being aware of some basic rules of logic are helpful. You'd say, well, you know, even if the Wall Street Journal has a bias or the New York Times has a bias, it doesn't mean they're wrong about this, right? Be you look at the evidence, you look at the facts. But for the most part, what's crucial in those moments is, is the initial reaction that you have, right? Don't make them feel stupid. Don't make them feel like an idiot or like they're misinformed, right? Ask them, how do you know that? Um, because asking a question is always an opening. <laughs> so how do you know that? And then talk about, well, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. And let me tell you why. I've heard from these other sources that X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so it's that initial reaction. I think that's important. Because if you're just like, well, that's crazy. They're not going to listen to anything you have to, have to say for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And I also just want to say uh, from all of us, thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. Sure. It's really wonderful to, to have your insights, uh, especially after... But I'm sure was was a busy night and a long night. Uh, it's sure. gonna be a long week. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But yeah. Thank you so much for making the time. Is uh, is there anything? I feel like I'm on a podcast. Is there anything you want to plug before we uh, before we let you go? <laughs> uh, just check out America Magazine. It's americamagazine.org. One of the things you know, I don't just go around saying this stuff. I actually try to do it. I don't always succeed, but I actually try to do it. And we're trying to do it at America. One of the things that I'm really proud of. At America Magazine, is that over the last six weeks, everybody, uh, every every voice from that big middle uh, in the Catholic Church has found a place at America Magazine. So whether they were voting for Mr. Trump or they were voting for Mr. Biden or what have you, um, not the extremists, but I'm talking about people in the in the middle who are trying to decide. And uh, so the most important thing that we can do is model that conversation. Like I said, our actions speak louder than words. If I went around saying this all the time, what I've just said to you, and yet I didn't with my own actions invite other people that I might disagree with into the conversation, then I'm not really making a difference. And uh, it's important that each of us as individuals make a difference. And you can make that difference um, uh, now, today. Um, you don't even have to be old enough to vote to make that difference. And I hope you do. And I'll say a prayer for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Please know you will all be in our prayers as well. Thank you. All right. God bless. Thank you very much, Father right. Juan. Thank you again. And thank you all for uh, submitting your questions. I know we weren't able to get to all of them, but uh, we really appreciate you uh, engaging in the conversation. Um, we are going to wrap up now just with a short prayer uh, to close us out, and then we will dismiss everybody. Uh, again, you can see in the chat, Ms. Freelander shared the link for America Magazine. They got a lot of great stuff, good podcasts, good video content, as well as stuff to read. 
Um, and there was also the link to the attendance sheet one more time, just in case you didn't get a chance to fill out attendance. All right, so let us once more remember that we are in the presence of God who loves us and calls us all together. We'll begin this prayer as we begin all good things in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all nations, Father of the human family, we give you thanks for the freedom we exercise and the many blessings of democracy we enjoy in these United States of America. We ask for your protection and guidance for all who devote themselves to the common good, working for justice and peace at home and around the world. We lift up all our duly elected leaders and public servants, those who will serve us in office. Unite us, O Lord, with a common purpose, dedication and commitment to achieve liberty and justice in the years ahead for all people and especially those who are most vulnerable in our midst. Amen. St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Peter. All right, thank you all once again. Thank you, Mr. Lucretio, and thank you, Ms. Friedlander, for running this and making it uh, all go very smoothly. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Um, there are later on going to be some roundtable discussions. If you would like to talk uh, about the election and how things are going, uh, look out for information on that. And otherwise, please know we'll be uh, thinking about praying for you all. And we'll see uh, Glory Cohort tomorrow. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.